Say good evening, everyone. I'm glad that you could be here. I'm a little biased, but I would have been just fine if Ryan and Cal had continued on with the service and led us in songs all night. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm sure Matt, I know Matt does, and, and Daniel and Guy and Stuart, we, we all have like a list somewhere where every time we hear of something or see something and think, ooh, that would be a good sermon at some point, we go and put that away on the list. Well, that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, something that I have pulled off of my list, and that is the question that I think maybe we're not asking, or I will say maybe we're not asking enough. And I'll tell you what that is in just a few minutes. We're going to start, though, in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 9, where there Solomon says, Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase his learning. The point that Solomon is making is that a wise person... When they come across some nugget of truth, we'll take that, we'll think about that, we'll consider that, apply that to their lives, and we'll be wiser. Now, I wonder if you've ever heard someone say something that really struck you or really stuck with you for years to come. Something that you considered to think about, I know that you have. Maybe it was one of your parents, you know. Some of you, your parents are no longer with us, but you might still say, I remember my mom always said whatever it was. Or maybe it wasn't something that you look, someone that you looked up to, but maybe it was a total outsider, somebody you didn't have a relationship with, but they said something and you thought, wow, that's right. And it really stayed with you. Maybe it was a, a visiting gospel preacher. You think of somebody who came 20 years ago in a meeting, and you think, you know, that Thursday night he said this, and I have always remembered that. Sometimes something just hits us, and it just stays with us. Now, I'm sure in his, the years that he has preached, Brother Guy has said a number of things that have stuck with you. I want to mention something that really has stuck with me. I think it's a question that we're not asking enough. The last time I remember God telling this story was uh, February 25th, 2018. I put that up there because it's on our website if you want to go back and listen to that sermon. A sermon titled, The High Cost of Sin. And God goes to tell this story about when he was at Weatherly. And he said, I was teaching a men's class. And during the course of the men's class, I said, are you closer to God now than you were this time last year? And I don't know why that question just sat on me. At the point that he said that, I have been preaching here part-time for nine years. Do you know how many people I have asked this question? Zero. After nine years of working here assisting in the pulpit, I've not asked a single person that question at that point in time. And I thought, how, how have I not asked that question? It's pretty important, isn't it? When we think about it, that's a, that's a pretty important question. And if you go back and listen to a guy tell the story, maybe what's the most interesting part of the story is that a man actually raises his hand and says, Brother Guy, I'm not as close to God now as I was a year ago. That's an honest heart giving an honest answer, isn't it? Now, there's more to the man's statement. We're going to come back to that at the end and talk about what else the man says. But how do we want to grow? Like when we say our prayers here, lots of times some of the men in the public prayer will actually say, may we grow in strength and in number. Now, we check that number part of the equation, don't we? Like five minutes ago, we stopped to post a number. Let's, let's see if we're growing in number. We ask that question every time we come in the building, don't we? What does it mean for us to actually grow in strength, though? It's about the individual growth. How much are you growing? How much am I growing? You know, it used to be that on the uh, first Sunday morning in January, I called it the State of the Church Sermon. I don't know what you called it. But you remember we used to have that, and it was here was our attendance numbers, and here's how many people were baptized, and here's how many people were restored. But what if we went around and asked everybody that, that question, hey, at the end of this year, as we're going into a new year, are you closer to God now than you were this time last year? And we say, yeah, 87% said they were. 
That's, that's actually not a good number, is it? That wouldn't be enough people. The point I'm making is, how can we know the answer to the question if we don't ever ask the question? The question itself matters because the answer matters more. It's extremely important. Have you asked yourself, am I closer to God now than I was a year ago? Now, in 2018, when God told that story, I don't know how many people were actually asking that question. But coming out of 2020, I heard a lot of people talking about that. You remember that? When we'd all sat at home and people said, I didn't grow this year. And we all could point and know why we hadn't grown, what had gone on in all of our lives. But now as we're, as we're moving hopefully past that, will we forget this question? Are we always trying to make sure that we're growing? Do we ask it of ourselves? If we're married, do you ask your spouse that? Are you growing? Are you stronger this year than you were this time last year? That's something we didn't need to know. If we have kids... You know, kids aren't mature enough to ask themselves this question. We have to talk to our kids, see, make sure they're growing. Collectively, as a congregation, asking each other, are we growing? Because if we're not asking this question, then we're just, we're assuming that we're growing. Now, if we just stopped right there, that one passage in Proverbs and these thoughts, I, I think it would have been worth our time to be here. But if we're not stronger, then why? Since it's such a simple question, I think there's really just a couple of simple answers. The first one is, we don't know. We don't have enough information to realize we're not growing. And we, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Maybe we just don't know. The, the second thing is, maybe we just don't care. If we're not stronger, if we're not growing closer to God, either we don't know or, or we don't care. I can't think of anything it could be other than those two things. Maybe we don't know because we didn't ask the right question. There are some people not asking the right questions in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 there. Paul says, We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. What he's saying here is, don't, don't look at somebody else and say, well, maybe I'm not doing everything I should do, but I'm doing better than they're doing. I know my kids aren't perfect, but, but they're better than this person's kids. He says, that, that is flawed logic. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13 says, a mature man, to be a mature man, we have to be in the fullness of Christ. That's our measuring standard. How am I living compared to how Christ lived? Now, when I do that, then I realize, well, i got a lot of work to do. If I compare myself to someone else, I might think, well, I'm doing okay. Maybe we're not asking the right question. And so that's why we don't know if we're growing closer. Do we lack knowledge? You know, some haven't learned, and that's not an insult on them. They, they just haven't been taught. Now, hopefully there's not anybody in this congregation who's that way. I think we have ample opportunity to learn and information is provided. But some people just don't know. Hosea 4 and verse 6, there God says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge leads to destruction. You know, I was pretty sheltered growing up. And my kids are pretty sheltered. And we went to the ark, to the ark exhibit, and we went to the creation museum. And as we're going through there, they compare creation versus evolution. And so Olivia's kind of reading some of the stuff that people who believe evolution believe. And she's astonished. Why would anybody believe that? I said, they don't know. They just don't know the truth. It's wonderful that a place like this is here where they can come and learn. Some people just don't know. It's not their fault. It's not that they're bad people. They just haven't been exposed to the information. And so some people just haven't had that opportunity. Maybe that's why some haven't learned. Acts chapter 20 and verse 27, there Paul says, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. It is important while we're here to make sure we study the whole Bible. That's sin and it's also salvation. 
2 Peter 3 and verse 18, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. That's what we have to teach. We have to teach all of it. It's not doom and gloom. It's not just sin. It's not all rainbows. We have to teach sin, which is ugly, and salvation, which is beautiful. You can't fully appreciate salvation if you don't understand sin and what it does and how it separates us from God. We have to teach all of that. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, We love because He first loved us. There are people in the world who do not know that. They don't realize that He first loved us. And without that knowledge, they can't make any correction. Now, I'm going to stack a couple of points quickly here. It is the job of parents to teach. Proverbs 22 and verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. It is the church's responsibility. There Paul tells Timothy that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth in 1 Timothy 3 and 15. So it is the parent's responsibility. It's also the church's responsibility. But I want to build to this point that teaching failures cause ignorance. Look what's happened here in Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord. They didn't know. Why? They hadn't been taught. Parents who had received this information from their parents didn't pass it on. And the church failed to teach. And so now there's a generation who, who doesn't know because they haven't been taught. Do we pass on the life lessons that so many of us picked up as kids? What about the uncomfortable lessons? Do you ever have any of those? Anything that you remember and think, ooh, that was an uncomfortable moment. I remember I had graduated high school, so I was 18, 19 years old. And if there's families here, you've had one of these Sunday mornings where everybody's in a bad mood. Now, I know what happens. We're all in a bad mood, and we all, you know mouth at each other all the way to church and have frowns on our face and then we come through the door and we all smile and like, oh brother, it's good to see you. I'm so glad to be here. Every one of you has done that who has a family. This was one of those moments at the Burns house. None of us were in a good mood. We were on our way to church. We were a half a mile from the church building and 19-year-old Al thought, this is a good time for me to let my parents know there's no need in us going this morning. None of us want to be there anyway. And my dad stopped the car in such a way that it got my attention. And then he told me, and everybody within a half mile radius, us not feeling like we want to be at church, or you thinking that we don't need to be at church, is all the more reason that we need to be at church. It shows that you haven't learned yet. I'm glad we're going this morning. Maybe you'll pick something up. And I was completely uncomfortable. For days, it was awkward at my house because I had said that. Whew. I survived. And one of these days, one of mine may say the exact same thing, and that life lesson is going to get passed on as uncomfortable as it was. I was talking to a lady the other day. She's got kids in their mid to late 20s. And she was telling me, she said, when I was growing up, uh, she said, when I was in my 20s and moved out, she said, there, was, there came a time where I needed some money. And she said, so I called my mom, I, Mom, I need some money. And she said, my mom told me, we don't have any to give you. She said, Al, my parents were members of the country club. They had plenty of money to give me, and I knew my mom had money to give me, and she just wasn't giving it to me. I said, Mom, I really need this money. And she says, Hon, you'll figure it out. She said, I got off the phone. I was so mad at my mother. So mad. And I slammed the phone down. That's when we had phones we could slam down. I slammed the phone down and I thought, I will never call you for money again. And she said, and I never did. And I remember how mad I was at my mother. 
She said, I've got kids in their 20s now. I remember the first time they came to me for money and I said, I'm so glad to help you because I didn't want them to feel like I felt toward my mother. She said, there's not a month that goes by where I don't spend at least $1,000 on one of those kids. And I think back to that moment and go, my mom was pretty smart. She knew what she was doing when she told me no. She had a life lesson that she knew she learned from, and she decided, I don't want to pass this to my kids. Now, finances are important. How much more important are spiritual things? All of us have probably had some uncomfortable lessons with our parents, but when the moment comes, we've got to pass those lessons on, as uncomfortable as they may be. Because our kids need that stress to grow, to grow closer to God. We need to emphasize understanding. The first seven chapters of Hebrews, the Hebrew writer talks about Jesus. He says, Jesus is better than men. He is better than the angels. He is better than Moses. He is better than Aaron. His priesthood is better than the priesthood of Aaron. His tabernacle is perfect. He takes seven chapters to go into this incredible detail. I want you to look at the first two verses of Hebrews chapter 8. Now, the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Did you see what he did there? He takes seven chapters of information and condenses it down and gives it to them. Memorization is a wonderful teaching tool. Okay, I remember in third grade learning the multiplication tables, which I still mostly remember today. And I have used those for many years. Memorization is wonderful. I don't discourage that at all. And if my kids could someday quote those seven chapters in Hebrews, that would be fantastic. But if I had to sum up what I want for them, it's this. I don't care if you can quote it word for word. Can you take the context and the content, put it in your own words, and give the concept back to me? Memorization is wonderful, but if they can summarize it, it means they've learned it and they understand it. And we need to teach that. Again, not putting off on memorization. That's a wonderful teaching tool. And, you know, we go through the judges and that kind of stuff. You know, I could probably name the judges if I sat down with maybe a pen and paper and had 20 minutes to think about it. And the kids can spit them out like that. But do we understand the importance of that and what was going on at that time in Israel's history? Do they understand the concepts? That, that's what we have to teach. We have to make sure that they understand. You know, if we ask ourselves, are we growing closer? I hope it's not because we don't know. Because we should. We've had every opportunity. And as parents, it shouldn't be that our kids don't know because we're teaching them and we're doing everything that we can with them. And the church is helping in every way that we can. And we all want to grow closer to God. So maybe, maybe it is that some people who do know, they don't care. And this is the more dangerous problem when somebody doesn't care. I want to show you two mindsets here. Ezra chapter 9 and verse 6, listen to the wording here. He says, Oh my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen above our heads and our guilt has grown even to the heavens. Can you feel the shame in this? Now look at Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 15. There God's talking about the children of Israel and He says, They were not ashamed at all of their sin, of the things that they had done. You see, you see the difference in the two mindsets? You see what shame, what role shame plays in our life? That we should care. We should be embarrassed when we make mistakes and when we act poorly and make poor choices. Why do we do that? Is it just the love of the world? You know, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, it says there, uh, Paul says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. 
Now, we usually think of this and take this verse and say, Demas loved worldliness. He loved the influence, the things of the world. You know, and there are people today who get caught up in this, in TV, movie, uh, music, fashion, social media, things that happen like that. And these things affect our thoughts, and they affect our language, and they affect our values. And if this does happen to anyone, I would ask, are these things even real? You know, I remember when the kids were young, we'd watch cartoons, there might be some monster in the cartoon, and I'll say, it's not real. You don't have to be afraid of it. Just because it's on TV, not everything on TV is real. And yet you have adults who watch adult entertainment, who see people living in sin and having a wonderful time with no consequence. That's every bit as fake. It's not real. Okay? But I don't know that that was necessarily the problem for Demas. Obviously he wasn't watching TV. That's not what I mean. I don't know that worldliness was his problem. It says, he loved this present world. He has watched Paul be beaten and whipped and shipwrecked and now under house arrest. Maybe he just loved being alive. Maybe he just loved spending time with his family. Maybe he just loved being with his friends. And maybe there are people who aren't here tonight who just love the same thing. It's not that they're bad people. It's not that they're off partying or doing some, you know, wild, worldly thing. They just are off with others doing something else. And they love this present world. You know, this idea here in 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 15 and 16, I think this addresses worldliness. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. But now, check out verse 17. First, we got these two verses maybe that deal with worldliness. But verse 17 says, The world is passing away. Maybe it wasn't that Demas was a terrible person. He just wanted to do some other things. Good things. Nothing wrong with spending time with family and friends. But understand that this world is passing away. And even that is not going to last. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Verse 17 concludes. Understand that love of this world in any way is still short-sighted. None of us is going to live forever. Maybe it's a failure to put off the old man, as Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22 says, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. You know, whatever struggles you have in life, I think most of us are probably going to struggle with our personal struggles again and again and again and again and again. And that can get frustrating. You think on a personal level, why have I not got past this? Like, I should have moved beyond this. But all of us, we have our own tendencies. You know, the, the thief is always going to have to deal with greed. The drunkard is always going to have to deal with alcohol. The person who has trouble with their eyes and what they look at is always going to lust after things they shouldn't be looking at. The angry person always going to have to deal with their anger. And whatever problem you have, you're probably going to always have to face that temptation. Now, as we mature, hopefully we find better ways of dealing with our problems. Whatever those triggers may be, we learn to avoid those and we learn how to respond when we can avoid them. But don't get frustrated just because you're dealing with the same thing over and over again. I think most of us are. And yet some people can't get beyond that, get overwhelmed by that, and just turn back to that. Continual sin has a numbing effect. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13 says, 
But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that no one of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin has a hardening effect. Eventually it catches up with her. It's Proverbs 20, uh, chapter 6 and verse 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Lots of times the consequences of sin show up in this world. But if not... Certainly in the world to come. You go back to the Old Testament, you even see this. God's patience eventually expires. In Zechariah there, chapter 7, and verse 13, he says, Just as he called and they would not listen, so they called and I would not listen. He says, I got tired of waiting on them. And in New Testament times, it remains the same for us. It's true. What happens if we go on willfully sinning? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26 tells us, After receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins. Now, as you're going down the interstate, you may see these signs that say, Buzz driving is drunk driving. And the point they're trying to make with that ad campaign is you don't have to come out of a restaurant sloppy drunk to be intoxicated. Just a little bit at the restaurant is enough to get you arrested. In the eyes of the law, you are drunk driving, even with just a little bit. In the eyes of God, you don't have to be out just living the most worldly life possible. You don't have to be just in wild, willful rebellion. Indifference to God is the same thing. Just a little bit of indifference is the same as willful sin in the eyes of God. It's important that we consider that. As we conclude, are you growing closer to God? Is Jesus Christ in you? 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you failed the test? This idea is the very thing he's talking about here. You need to ask yourself, is Jesus in you? Because if he's not, then you've failed the test. And we need to do something about that. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and unrighteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to go back to the man's response, the man who raised his hand and said, Brother Guy, I am not as close to God now as I was a year ago. But that's going to change. I want you to ask me this question next year. Ask me then what you just asked me, and I'll tell you and I'll show you. I know why I'm not as close now as I was even a year ago, and it's all my fault. I chose what I've done, and I'm making a change beginning now. You know, it takes a lot for a person to say something like that. First off, it would help to be among friends to make a statement like that, wouldn't it? People that you didn't have to worry about judging you. See, attendance is not our end goal. Our goal is growth. That's what we want here at O'Neill. We want this to be a place where your individual faith matures and where we look at each other and we want the same for each other, that each other's individual faith matures, and that we honor God in a way that is pleasing to Him. That's what we want here. Are you growing? Are you closer to God? And if not, why not? Is it because you don't know? Or is it because you don't care? Psalm 119 and verse 59, the psalmist says, I considered my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. Do you know this evening God's love and expectation? If you're not a Christian, then you need to consider what God has done. Or if you do know, and you are a Christian, but maybe your life hasn't been what it should be recently. We ask not that you consider, but that you reconsider this evening. This evening as we close, if there's anything that we can help you do to grow closer to God, whether it's come and have your sins washed away in baptism, or if you have some public sin you'd like to confess and like the prayers of the church, we'd love to help you with that. If we can help you with anything, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.